Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming today. I know we've got a bunch of people in there. Uh, we always like to give just a couple minutes after the hour for people to kind of sneak in. Um, but we are here now and we are going to get rolling. Um, yeah, so I'm super pumped about today. Um, I think uh, field field data acquisition, to me, this is like the fun part of laser scanning, uh, of all the different parts of it. You know, planning, you gotta do it, but it's not that fun. Uh, uh, you know, actually getting out of the field and collecting the data, um, all sorts of interesting things happen. You have to, you know, adapt, survive, uh, figure out how to deal with it. And so just lots and lots of lessons learned, lots of kind of fun tips and things like that. So with that, let's dive in uh do some quick housekeeping here so uh everybody on the call is muted uh, of course other than uh our our panelists uh today um if you have questions please ask that via the questions tool in GoToWebinar. we will uh, try and answer questions on the fly as we go if they're relevant to kind of the flow of of the topics uh, if not we'll save those to the end and uh, do some Q&A at the end. And uh, the last uh, Scandabim Universities, uh, we've had so many questions that we ended up uh, taking an extra 30 minutes to do Q&A after the hour. Uh, we will probably do that this time as well. So if you can stick around, great. But if not, don't worry. Uh, the session is going to be recorded. It always is. And we will send the recording out. Also, if you ask a question and you have to go, uh, we will try to answer that, uh, you know, either following up uh, through the LinkedIn group uh, or sometimes we do these uh, kind of separate Q&A videos uh, where we'll answer uh, any remaining questions just, uh, just on video. So, yeah, and then about a week or so after the webinar, you'll anybody that's registered will get a link to that recording. So if you talk to anybody else and they want to see the class, tell them to go register. Uh, yeah, the class already happened. But if they register, then they'll get that recorded link so yeah housekeeping done and with that let's meet our lovely panelists um lindsay would you uh, introduce yourself please uh yes uh my name is lindsay pritchard fox i'm the founder and ceo of tiger build um, which is focused on bringing a uh, single source bim enabled project planning to the residential market and that includes um scan to them um and i love having a chance to talk about what we're doing um because quite honestly about jumping in with both feet and kind of figuring out it as you go and getting a great network of people to support you in the in the endeavor so thanks for having me absolutely um yeah and david uh this is your uh, your first time on scan bim university let's uh, let's hear a little bit about you it is. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm very excited to be here and very excited to have this conversation with you guys. Um, I'm an application specialist with TopCon Solutions. Um, in that, my job kind of allows me to <clears throat> experience very, well, different types of ways to integrate scanning, like our hardware to software workflows. <laughs> you know, there's there's so many different things and ways to get into it. But um, <clears throat> it allows me to kind of get out into the field and um interact with our clients when when we're setting up for scanning to do the training um, when we're going to actually process that data right so it gives me a kind of look all the way around in that and um you know i as you guys can see i have seven so well seven plus years of horizontal and vertical construction experience i am the co-host of brewing with bim and i am a certified professional in structure architecture and mep with revit like i said i kind of get all over the place <laughs> and uh i'm just i'm really happy to be here again happy to have these conversations with you guys i'm always ready to learn from other you know industry professionals like yourselves and and share what knowledge i can fantastic and you actually put us on to uh mr ryan sweeney ryan uh likewise a little bit about yourself yeah, so I actually, before coming to Fix40, I was actually one of Dave's co-workers and that's how we got to know each other. It was over at TopCon, but uh, right now at, I'm at Fix40. I'm the channel sales manager um, for North America. So I basically work with all the resellers on helping them find the right solutions for you guys and managing that whole aspect. But my my background's a 
quite a bit more extensive than just kind of working resale, resale or as a salesman. Um, I started my career off at working for an excavation company, doing machine control, managing the hardware, installing it, solving it, doing uh, model building, doing takeoff, doing as-built management. We were, actually got into drones in 2011, 2012, and have been using. I've been using Fix40 since then. Um, so we were doing. We were actually one of the first contractors in the United States doing aerial mapping for construction, um, and then also got into laser scanning. Had a side, look. We had a side business separately for that. So I've done a lot of inspection work, a lot of modeling for like Yale University, and a lot of. I've kind of had my hands in a lot of different aspects of uh, construction. Um, so I've I kind of gotten a well-rounded experience in the field, and it kind of helps me take it to know help all you guys out you know when it comes to the sales side um and i'm also part 107 licensed and you know obviously i've been certified by pix 40 as you know being proficient in the software and stuff (laughs) fantastic uh and yeah our our fifth panelist today is the lovely znf uh, 5016 right here uh who will be making whirring noises at some point i'm sure (laughs) um but uh, but uh, other other than the scanner that I happen to have standing next to me, um, yeah, uh, uh, Kelly Cohn with uh, ClearEdge 3D, uh, run our industry strategy team. Been with ClearEdge about five years. Was at Beck, a uh, big uh, design build contractor out of Dallas before that. Texas boy, obviously. Go hook 'em horns. Um, yeah. And so that's my background. Uh, most people that come to these things have unfortunately gotten emails from me that said come to these things so um yeah all righty well let's 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 dive into our topics uh get the actual advanced slide button here so uh just kind of a loose flow today we are gonna try and roll with uh talking about some equipment uh subject matter first uh, then move into control and coordinate systems, because that's obviously a, an important topic when you're doing data acquisition in the field. Uh, then go through some field challenges and then kind of have some time at the end for some kind of pro tips, uh, productivity boosters, suggestions uh, from, from the panelists. So uh, that is our rough agenda. And so with with that, let's let's open our equipment conversation by talking about choosing the right equipment so i don't know who wants to dive in first on this but uh somebody i'll take it it. let's go so (laughs) (laughs) let's run with it now i i mean we're seeing a lot of different uses right uh i mean obviously just with the picture there your scanners your terrestrial scanners your handheld kind of mobile scanners drones um it's all based off of the usage case i think in terms of what data you're really trying to pull where you're trying to you know utilize this data in kind of the downstream process that we really start looking at which piece to use now i'm seeing so many different things with you know mobile scanners we're starting to see the iphone 12 have that lidar data so we're seeing a lot of like possibilities there we're just uh in all honesty we're not seeing the the precision, you know what I mean? The farther that you get, the more disruption or deflection that you're gonna see with those. But of course, they all have their use cases. And I think that's what uh, you gotta focus on is that use case, again, and finding what data is gonna work and for for what you need, that level of detail that you need to achieve, right? Right, absolutely. And of course, there's a bunch of different types. I mean, I, we talked about this in our, uh, our 101 session, which uh, Lindsay was a participant in. Uh, and uh, talked a lot about uh, kind of the range of terrestrial scanners. And so, you know, I, I know Lindsay's got some experience with the BLK and uh, I think also a little bit, uh, a little bit with the Matterport, right? Or uh, am I, am I confusing? No, no, I steer clear of Matterport. I just felt like I can speak. Uh, my core competency is if you want to get into the laser scanning game, where do you start? Mm -hmm. and um, kind of feeding the information out there that uh, BLK is a great place to start, but you have to know its limitations from the get-go because you're not going to make a 20K plus investment in a product just to outgrow it like a month later. Um, So we are residential. Um, Our largest uh, 
residential space was 10,000 square feet. We had 140 scans and very much digested that project without an issue. Uh, we had all the functionality that we needed out of the BLK, um, but I could very much see where if you get onto some of the message boards and you start seeing the folks that are using the BLK for those 300 plus scan, that they're really hitting some pain points. Um, so it's a great entry point, but just identify that if you're gonna be getting into the larger scale commercial spaces where you're gonna need accuracy, accuracy across a big vast space, that I don't know that, that the BLK is gonna be a great fit for you because where we really um, fit is that I have to navigate through hallways and closets and like, you know, basements and crawl spaces and all of that works really well with the BLK because we've got those planar surfaces to register off of um, or put our targets up. But if I had a big giant warehouse space, I know it's being used for that, but I don't know if that would be my long-term best, uh, best laser to use for that type of application. Yeah. No, and it's 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 this kind of uh, I think we've seen a lot of these really great low cost sensors uh, come in, whether it's something like the Matterport that's structured light, you know, under you know five thousand dollar range. Uh, you've got the BLK, which is in that twenty thousand dollar range. We've got you know Faro instruments in the thirty thousand dollar and up range. Um, and the the thing that we talked about in the one on one class is you kind of have you kind of have two classes of terrestrial scanners. We've got um, you know, what I'll call these kind of fast, you know, quick, um, you know, go out there, scan a lot of stuff, don't worry about leveling it. Um, you know, these are instruments that got have IMUs in them, which uh, that's an inertial measurement unit. Um, then they're using that to figure out kind of what up is. Um, and that's good enough for these smaller projects because, you know, you, you, that, that error kind of compounds the bigger the project is, the longer the measurements are. And so when you're dealing with lots of smaller measurements, shorter range, you can kind of get away with that stuff. And then you get to these larger, uh, larger projects, longer range shots, and all of a sudden, you know, that's when you're really going to want some kind of survey grade scanners. And that's that's the instruments here on the left, right? Which are they have a they have a DAC, which I have just completely temporarily forgotten what that stood for. But <laughs> An acronym? You forgot the. I know. <laughs> the talking, right? <laughs> Dual axis compensator. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, you've got uh, you've got uh, these kind of different ranges. Cost, you know, obviously comes with it. Uh, things with DAC usually have longer range because they can handle it, uh, and not have huge errors. Uh, but of course, you know, there's also a lot of newer technology out of there. Um, you know, some of some of the scanners that have those more accurate sensors can, uh, you know, also survey. So that's, you know, they can actually measure control points in the field. And we'll talk about that later when we're talking about getting on control in the field, because that's super useful, uh, just being able to do it in the field. Um, and then uh, kind of a newer trend uh, the last couple of years have been these hybrid instruments. So these are these are kind of fun um because basically they combine a traditional survey functionality uh, like a total station uh, with a uh, you know basically 360 dome laser scanning functionality or at least focused laser scanning functionality um have any of y'all uh, used some hybrid instruments on your projects oh yeah i actually i've i've used the gtl and i know ryan has as well um, that is a fun piece of equipment to work with, just, you know, it, especially with downstream and the processing kind of point, just because the uh, the scan's already registering itself from those control points or occupy points that you're establishing with the total station in that sense. But, you know, Kelly, one thing I wanted to bring up here was the exciting thing about these hybrid instruments and kind of thinking about what instrument you need for the job is is pairing these instruments together. Right. If we can use the the strengths and recognize the weaknesses of each piece of equipment, we can start to build that symbiotic relationship with our instruments and say, OK, you know, the GTL is great at, you know, giving us the control points and doing this scan. But it does take, you know, if we're getting a high level, like a high detail scan, it's going to take four to six minutes to get that scan. And are you trying to do that every setup through every, you know, every scan for this building? No, that's a lot. But 
maybe we could go ahead and use the GTL and maybe combine it with one of the mobile scanners that are maybe not as accurate, right? But then we can kind of walk through and then use the control points and those GTL kind of scans or those more precise scans to tie everything together and bring in some of that, you know, kind of faster. And essentially, it's just a way to figure out how to optimize the time that you're on the site and figuring out less setups. Because I mean, with a mobile scanner, you're going to be able to just go ahead and walk through or, you know, maybe a small setup go ahead, take it and go. Whereas something like, you know, the GTL, we do have to set that up. You have to make sure it's over the control point. You have to make sure it's level. There's an entire process that you got to do to get that. So it's just figuring out that optimized kind of timeline of how, how, how long do you want to be there? Where, what, what scan kind of plan do you have? What map are you laying out and, and where can we optimize some of our other instruments and um, kind of, you know, just spend less time on site, but really also get the good data because that's another, you don't want to just rush through everything and then you get to processing and next thing you know, you're spending, you know, a week or two, if not more, trying to bring this data together. I mean, good Lord, we'll talk about some ways that you can um, kind of trick the system there in a little bit with those control points and everything. But uh, yeah, I feel like knowing what you have in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, the hardware and what their strengths are can really benefit us for being on site as well as processing. And that's kind of one of the nice things about um, the uh, the hybrid instruments, because like Dave was saying, it's probably not something you want to use to jump around a indoor building or anything like that with just because it's it's a lot of setup. I mean, it's essentially a total station that you can push a button on. It works and operates the exact same way. There's just another button in the software to hit scan, which, you know, in a confined area, that's just a pain to do. Um, as you can imagine. But the nice thing about it is if you're a surveyor who might want to do scanning every once in a while, it's, it's something I kind of always talk to them about the, their workflows. Just like do the same thing. If you, you know, you take your shots, but like just hit scan because like Dave said, even the high range scan or high detail only takes four to six minutes. So, you know, if you're surveying here, you got the total station set up, you know, before you move the jump, just hit scan because, you know, you never know what you need. And if it captures something good, why not? <laughs> Why not? Why not collect the scan data? Yeah. Well, I, I know Ryan, you've got a lot of experience on the photogrammetry and the mobile side, and we we did have a question come in, which is, uh, which lidar is preferred for drones? And the answer for that is, you know, if the drone is moving while it's scanning, therefore it's mobile. Um, yeah. <laughs> then, then you're talking, you know, Velodyne pucks or Hokuyo pucks, you know, mounted onto a drone, things like that, or a small yeah. handheld scanner like GeoSlam. Uh, but yeah, the mobile scanners yeah. are new and super fun yeah i mean there's so many different routes to go with the lidar sensor and there are different specs there's not really one to say like oh this is the best because you know the price points between them all is way drastically different than a regular terrestrial scanner i mean like you have different ranges but like in survey versus like a faro but the difference isn't that much i mean we're talking maybe thirty thousand dollar difference on a base gls versus a base Faro. That's, I know it sounds like a lot, but it's not versus a good LIDAR setup for a drone can be on the high end about 300, where an affordable one can be maybe 15 to 20. So it, that's a conversation you definitely need to have with your, with the LIDAR dealer specifically, because the time for shots and the density, there's just so many little details that make those important. Um, and, you know, there's new stuff coming out every day, like the DJI L1, that's uh, probably going to be what most of you guys would, I, I would say that's aiming to be like the best cheap entry. I need LiDAR, but I don't need to spend $300,000 on LiDAR setup. Um, but yeah, like Kelly was saying, my main folks, my main specialty is drones and mobile mapping, but like I actually own my own Faro. Like I've been scanning for uh, eight eight-ish years pretty consistently. So I've kind of used a bit of everything, um, which helps. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and you know, th to get back to kind of the core of the question, right, they, they, I think the key thing is really understanding the characteristics of the instruments. Right. Understanding their, their strengths or weaknesses, and then, you know, choosing the right one for the work you're going to do, or the right ones, right? Because I, th I think when you're a small a small shop, um you know doing doing projects you don't have the budget to buy three instruments so you try right. and buy an instrument that will do everything right and those unfortunately tend to be the more expensive instruments exactly. um, 
but uh, at least within each price bracket, right? Right. But you yeah. try and get an instrument that'll do everything you're going to do. But as as you grow and you get more, you know, the capability to get more instruments, then you can really right. start mixing and matching, which I think that mm -hmm. that was always the fun. Deal. Yeah, so that's when it yeah. got like really fun scanning because we had this scanner and this scanner and this scanner, and we could take this one for this job or take this one and this one for this job. Right. And like Merge all that data together. <laughs> my favorite yeah. superhero team up right now for scanners is that is the GTL and the RTC 360, right? Because the RTC 360 is like the fastest blow and go scanner on the market. It's amazing in terms of how fast it can collect data, but it doesn't have a DAC, so you can't trust how level it is, and you'll get really bad issues on larger projects with that. Oh, but if you have the GTL, you just kind of go and set your control with the GTL, do the scans in those locations, and then you cloud to cloud all the RTC scans to the GTL scans. And then, boom, global accuracy, local accuracy, great levelness. I mean, it's just, oh, yeah. yeah nice that's workflow. Nice yeah, I mean, like, even with the question, too, with LiDAR, I mean, this might be a little controversial, but, like, personally, on the UAV, if you're a smaller company, I wouldn't even bother going that route unless you're doing a lot of aerial flights on vegetated property that you need to hit ground or if you're if you need very accurate asphalt data but to me at that point you're almost better going a mobile mapper than trying to fit you know yeah. a fifty thousand dollar scanner in the air when you know it can come crashing out i mean not that that happens often but that's always still a very real concern versus mounting it to the back of your truck so <laughs> Yeah, or or a backpack one. I mean, I I've seen. Right. I mean, the you know Navis just came out with the VLX, which is that funky looking stormtrooper one on the prior page, and I've seen some you know as as mobile scanners go, some incredible data out of that scanner. I mean, it's it's not cheap certainly, but you know in the past, you know, I would always tell people if it's mobile, expect like plus or minus two centimeters of noise. You know, you're going to get some noisy data out of it, and that's hard to do precise modeling from, but I. I that that one has really caught my eye recently. Just the quality of the data coming out of it is is kind of a step better than anything else I've seen out of mobile scanners. And so mm -hmm. um, they're, now they're I know. Progressing. I was going to say I know we're going into it anyways, but there are um, as we're going to get into the control and coordinate systems kind of conversation and what you can do. Um, there there are things you can do with these scanners, the terrestrial or the drones, that you can improve the results that you're going to get. So certain things like these ground control points or targets or, you know, certain things there's, uh, we, we of course want to talk about that here, but, um, you know, you may need to use something like that. You can pay for maybe a cheaper kind of scanner or mobile mapping device that might partner with, of course, like I said, targets or spheres, balls or whatever, you know, you're going to put up there ornaments in some case. <laughs> and, you know, you can use some of these items to, to really help position your scans or to help with processing down the road. So there are, um, you know, just finding the, the, the key kind of points, again, those strengths, right? And then how we can um kind of improve that with some modifications of other equipment yeah I, I, absolutely I think, key to know, I think it's key to know what your what your scans are going to be used for too before you're even out on site um so oh, i have the yeah. benefit of having it all be like internalized but um yeah if you're picking a scanner and you don't know if it's going to be used for meps or knowing all of that knowing what your your data needs to be used for is key when you're selecting the laser and also when you get on site how you're proceeding through the through the scanning process definitely definitely and then how that scan can be used downstream like you said it can they be used in the kind of scan to bim maybe edgewise creation or is it being brought into navis are we trying to do some type of verification against it are we trying to get the floor flatness are we you know any potholes deviations in the surface you, you want some good dense data for things like that to work correctly so you got to know kind of at, at what point is it beneficial at what point is it overkill which is something we discussed at length in the 102 webinar last month. So by all awesome. means, if you haven't seen that, go check it out. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I I wanna I wanna move into control because uh, I'm a control freak. But um, uh, I do want to really quickly uh, answer another question that came in. Um, so uh, one of them was about uh, providing experience with the iPhone 12 Pro uh, LiDAR. So, of course, the new iPhone, uh, just so everybody knows, and I think the iPad, they have an actual ranging sensor in them, which is super cool. Yeah, both um, the iPhone and iPad. 
Yeah. And uh, Dave had mentioned earlier, there's definitely some accuracy trade-offs and range trade-offs. So, you know, I've, I, I actually, I'll, I'll give a shout out to um, Matthew Bird. He's got some great stuff on LinkedIn about this. He's done a lot of testing with it. Um, so Matt is a great resource for that. So I'm not going to dive into that here because he does a much better job of it than probably well, anybody else. I was a, actually uh, going to mention something quick about that too, if you don't mind. So, you know, obviously there is uh, some range limitations on the LiDAR sensors on the iPad and the iPhone. So like you're not shooting a warehouse with it. Like there's no wor world and that's possible unless you have a whole lot of too much time on your hands. But um to kind of plug one of our products a little bit, uh, we actually have an app called Pixwordy Catch. It can download on any iPhone, any iOS or Android device. But obviously, with the iOS, we actually leverage the lidar data with our photogrammetry. So it's super simple. It shows you the correct overlap as you're taking pictures of you know the thing on the ground. Um, but it's also simultaneously using the lidar data to generate its you know a, a lidar model, and then it to get sent up to our cloud and we'll actually process the LiDAR data and the photogrammetry together. So you use the good light, you know, the more accurate LiDAR data as a base and use the images to process the rest. So there's a lot of really cool workflows that are possible now with those LiDAR sensors. Yeah, and no, that's, that's a great point. Um, yeah, and I, I highly encourage people to also go check out Matt's uh, stuff on LinkedIn there. It's, uh, it's, it's really thorough and really helps you understand kind of the limitations and the strengths of, of that technology. Um, all righty. Um, yeah, well, let's dive into control. Uh, we can always come back and answer some more questions later. Um, so, uh, yeah, control, control and control points. Um, Show up on site. Huh? decide where your first scan is going to be and then i think what's awesome is that we can start saying that laser scanning means that you're not going back to site so then you have to sort of strategically plan um how you're going to get your best coverage and then like which scanners and which program which uh software programs are going to ensure that you don't have to go back to site that's kind of my key point with all of this yeah that that is after all the whole benefit right um, mm -hmm. Though if you do have to go back to site, having control is really, really helpful to make sure stuff overlaps. Um, so it, before we dive totally into kind of control, uh, coordinate systems and stuff like that, um, any kind of time you're talking about control uh, with a scanner, you're also talking about targets uh, because the scanner has to have something it can recognize with the you know laser. So um, we had this from the first session, just a couple different types of targets. You can see more survey stuff on the left, um, kind of planar targets, which often are printed on paper and then just taped to the wall. And then there's geometric targets like spheres. Uh, I, 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 uh, Lin Lindsay, why don't, why don't you tell your lovely story about black and white checkerboard tile real quick? Well, yeah, I mean, you have to, one of the reasons why um, I selected the BLK is because I wanted to be able to do cloud to cloud registration on site because I wanted to be able to you know, I was new with this and I wanted to make sure that I was getting the coverage I needed. And that was like, they had the mobile uh, cloud to cloud registration on site and um, using targets was kind of something that could supplement that. And we got out on site and it was, um, it was a black and white check floor, really, really standard for some, you know, 1930s, like interior decor. And I got back and I had done the matching with the targets and like, boom, my entire like first floor is just has 20 targets all over the place. <laughs> this isn't, this isn't, this isn't working well. Um, but it definitely drove home the fact that this, that the laser is actually picking up and matching. And it, it is helpful to kind of um, see that in this kind of like just broad expanse of target matching. Yeah. And I had a similar experience with spherical targets with scanning a mall where they had hung Christmas ornaments. So there were, you know, literally a thousand balls dangling from the ceiling and the scanner, most of them were matte. And so the scanner picked them up and thought they were all spherical targets, but they were on, you know, monofilament. Every time the air conditioning turned on, they moved. So that, that introduced some pretty severe error into, <laughs> into our registration. So that was not fun. So yeah, targets can go wrong, right? Um, and then, of course, you know, uh, if you're dealing with some kind of a hybrid instrument or something like that, you know, there's also, um, you know, kind of 
more traditional control point stuff, you know, nails in the ground, um, you know, different noticeable spots. Uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, favorite scanners out there, he actually has a template cut out of a target, of a black and white target, and he carries black spray paint. And he'll just, anytime it's like there, it's for construction sites, so it's gonna get covered up. So that he just slaps the template up and spray paints. <laughs> and those are his targets. Uh, which I, I love that story. And I know, uh, David, you had said something about washable markers, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, washable markers are great when you're out on site. If you don't have anything, um, I, I've seen people use, you know, just markers to make a cross on there. So they got something to shoot at and they'll put a number by it so they know where they are and stuff like that. It's very helpful. Just use the tools that you have. I mean, I've, I've seen chalk, sharpies, crayons. It's it's kind of whatever you got uh, to mark on that wall and give you something to recognize. Um, it, it's funny. I had a, a, a processing class I went out to a couple weeks ago, and this scan I didn't go out and and, and help with. I just had the a, a representative go out with them, and they took the scan and came back with I think it was like 25 to 30 scans of a three story building so that was kind of my first like uh all right we'll see what's up we'll see how this is so we'll get into it and as i'm trying to process i realized there's no targets and they wanted to you know and you have 25 scans 25 to 30 scans for a three-story building so you know i i realized very quickly like hey guys this is this is going to take a while and then we're getting a lot of deflection. It's curving off. It can't rotate it right. I'm like, guys, we, we need to go back out there. You know, it just, it helps to see um, some of the issues that people are experiencing when they don't use this kind of stuff, you know, that you don't know what you don't know. But uh, there are things you can simply do as to making marks on the wall. We saw some of the targets on that last sheet that had numbers on them, things like that. It's very helpful to have uh, different tools like that as you're moving through the scan so you know where you are. Well, and I loved, uh, you know, Lindsay works on small enough projects that, you know, targets aren't super necessary um, because, you know, cloud to cloud is pretty reliable at that scale. But I, I loved how you guys were using targets. So share, share that real quick because I, I thought that was such a creative use. Oh, so essentially, oh, wait, oh, Lindsay. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> David, did you change your name? It was perfect I'm timing. Talking, I was just Lindsay. talking to him this morning. It's, I'm getting my coffee in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lindsay froze, so it was like perfect timing. I'm going to be Lindsay for now. <laughs> well, what we were talking, what we were discussing is so the things that I have found really helpful for on-site and making sure that my um, in-office uh, post-scan uh, workflow is as fast as possible is one determining a grid system. This is something I've learned from uh, Greg Hale from HaleTip, which is fantastic. Is uh, choose your scan grid. You know, when I'm getting on site, I see the entry door and I can see like a straight line back to the house and I like set up my scans in a series so that they're all linear and then if that, and then go off and basically create that, um, you know, the vertical and the horizontal planes that I'm going to be using as my baselines. And when I'm with a team member, one of the things that we were talking about with Kelly was that I had all of these targets. I didn't need them for the wall. And I could strategically like place the targets on the floor for uh, a member of my team so that they knew exactly where to set up the next scanner. And it's interesting because when you're determining where your scan locations are going to be, sometimes it's like, how far off can I put them so that I don't have to do as many scans? However, when we were trying to like stay to that grid system, because that grid system is helping me post uh, post scan processing, is you know you'll do those scans um maybe closer or like staggered in a way that you wouldn't necessarily get maximum distance um so being able to strategically place a marker on the floor for where the scanner is going to be for your team and then you can just move through the entire property and just look, have it all planned uh was fantastic and then um knowing that uh, when you're going up those stairs that you're going to get the overlap that you're that you need um, is really useful and I think that's one of the unique ways of planning out your scan locations yeah yeah I think I, I, I'm sorry I, to interrupt well, well I, I just I gotta keep us I gotta keep us on schedule <laughs> oh, sorry yeah I know I want to talk about it I'm like oh man yes the, the scan like the maps the planning is huge 
Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna run out of time. But yeah, and and we had some great planning content in the prior session, talking a lot about how to do that grid system, all that all that stuff. And and actually, uh, one of Greg's team was there, uh, Samantha. So uh, by all means, check that out. Shout out again. Uh, but uh, quick pro tip, because uh, I know these are handy for people. Um, and this is this is something that I think a lot of people don't know. But when you set up targets, don't set them all up at the same height. I've noticed that when you take a newbie out scanning and you ask them to hang targets, like you give them a stack of paper and they walk around and they just go slap them at head height on every wall and column they can find. And the whole point of targets is to find geomet unique geometric shapes between the targets, triangles basically. And the, the height is yet a third dimension for you to achieve unique dimensions. And particularly if you're going into a building where you have like column bays that are equally spaced. If all of your targets are at the same height on the same face of all the columns, you're not going to get unique geometric shapes between those targets for the target matching to actually work well. So like make sure you're using that Z dimension and some, some are high, some are low, some are, you know, head height. That really makes a big difference if you're using targets uh, for registration to actually get a good automatic match result. Um, so uh, quick, quick random pro tip there. Um, and then we had we had one uh, one other one, and this came in from uh, from a prior prior webinar conversation. But um, uh, loved loved this tip about uh, getting scanners that can't level themselves very well, like RTC, BLK, um, the, the, most of the Faro scanners, etc., that have an IMU. You can go out and buy uh, a laser line level like uh, like this, or a rotating laser level like this. They're really nice and accurate at a reasonable range, and you can go hang targets exactly on that laser line, and then you can set an elevation on those targets, and then that will actually take your data and level it out. And you can do that in recap even, right? So you can go hang, you know, three or four targets where that thing scans them, set set that in as a little CSV file, and then boop, all of a sudden your stuff is leveled. And so it's a huge, huge help uh, in terms of uh, dealing with some of these scanners that maybe don't do a good job of leveling themselves so wanted to throw those two out there uh, but after that I, I do want to have a deeper conversation about using control points or just go out and get uh, like a Manfrotto uh, tripod that has a bubble on it yeah yeah and, and you, again for, for don't for, use the one that comes from BLK at all just throw it out and i'm the most frugal person you can meet but no hard no definitely don't use it um i think it's cute that they tried to get it so that it fits in the bag so perfectly but no <laughs> nice nice tripods don't skimp on accessories that's actually that's like another huge tip that i give people it's like you, you buy a eighty thousand dollar instrument and a eight hundred dollar tripod like come on yeah. people yeah. Like, get the nice yeah. tripod get the wheeled cart get the accessories it's an eighty thousand dollar instrument get the most use out of it right get, get the good accessories for it but uh but yeah because if if uh but if you need to get the control set up you've got targets and all this kind of stuff um you know usually that's shot with a total station um somebody's got to go out there unless you've got a hybrid instrument somebody's going to go out there and shoot those control points for you um there are some exceptions, you know, you can do assumed, I mean, there's there's three different types of coordinate systems kind of, right? There's kind of assume, like an arbitrary one, which that's what happens if you don't set a control system. If this is the zero direction of the scanner and I set it up right here, the center of the scanner becomes zero, zero, zero. That's how the scanning works. That's an arbitrary coordinate system, right? But a lot of them, you can actually set them up, point them a direction and give that point a, a location. So like if you've got a, laser plummet or just an old-fashioned plummet even uh, you can actually set up on a point give it a value and decide that this is one foot one foot one foot and then shoot north with a compass and say that's north and you'll at least be close um, and then you can go to like you know project coordinate systems getting on a something that'll match the drawings or the model uh, or going all the way to survey coordinate systems um, but we were, we were discussing that to create an origin to origin or you know your scanned bin so one of the things we've said i've said on the last is uh set your origin 
in your software and the BLK will automatically set the zero zero at the first scan location. Um, so maybe be a little more strategic about where that first scan location is. And when we're creating that, so I'm thinking about what the framing plan would be. And it's usually the primary corner of a structure and you'd frame from that. So if you're setting up your first scan there and you'd said, take, take that plumb and the measure to the corner of the structure that you'll be using as your zero zero point, and then when you're back in your office, you can make sure that you're you're setting those distance accurately and locking it in origin or origin means if your um, your cloud gets uh, unloaded from your Revit file that you can get it back in and you can get it in at the exact place where you were using it to model. And I would say that that was like number one is I don't you can't, you can't rely on lining up your laser scan with your model if, if it gets disconnected you can't do that by eye that's missing the entire point of this so you need, need that control point coordinate yeah. systems are very very huge when it comes to well point clouds and then in modeling if you want to take that information downstream um, we find so many times in the design industry if, if it's like a file is coming from civil or something like that if it doesn't have the right coordinate system uh, it, the the project is jacked up from it from that point forward. You know, you can try to move everything and uh, transform it, right? Try to manually align things, but you never really get that perfect alignment. You're you're eyeballing it at that point. So having these coordinate systems from the get go or using these control points to help align and let this scan knows know where it is is very 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 key. Um, I actually wanted to talk about this as well. Um, I read a report on. Um, like photogrammetry, drone scanning, and using, you know, cloud to cloud overlap versus using ground control points or tie bars. And the data clearly showed that um, the accuracy that was gained, like the precision in terms of being able to recognize where it was, but also stitching the, the cloud together, stitching that scan together was much quicker and again, much more precise utilizing a ground point or some type of element that it can recognize they had less flights that they had to take because with a flight you know a cloud to cloud overlap you have to get a specific amount of overlap in order for it to register and pull together but using something like a ground control point allows you to essentially or a control point in this sense even allows you to do those passes or take those scans and ideally do less but still be able to recognize that that precision in the scan or uh in the you know photogrammetry itself yeah, well, that's and it's, this is one of those things is, you know, back when I started scanning, you know, my my C10 that I that I used would take, you know, an hour to do a scan of reasonable density. And so, like, you couldn't do cloud to cloud because you couldn't get enough overlap. You couldn't afford to get enough overlap. But, you know, now we've got scanners that, you know, scan a million or two million points per second. All of a sudden, cloud to cloud is a lot more viable. Um, because, you know, when it takes a minute and a half to do a scan, I had a couple setups, right? But um, I think the other thing that's interesting there is the, you know, always planning to have more than one way to register your data because then you have redundancy and most types of registration have strengths and weaknesses. And so by having multiple, by, by creating that kind of hybrid registration methodology, you end up with a much better overall result because the different mechanisms make up for the weaknesses of the other mechanisms. So you get a much tighter registration overall. And it's super critical. Um, like having control ceases to be an option the moment you have two different types of instruments. If you're going to have a drone and a scanner, you got to have control. Good luck getting those things to match any other way. Well, and then, actually about that, there, I was actually at TopCon working on a, a workflow that was pretty awesome with our with TopCon's RDM1. So that's a mobile mapper for road scanning, which uh, will give you, it's all tied into GPS. So you're going to get, you know, uh, it's actually PPK. So your data set is good accuracy wise, as long as, you know, that PPK level of accuracy is applicable for your job. Like you're not going to use PPK for bolt measurements on a bridge, but um, after scanning a section of road, you know, we wanted to capture all everything beyond the road, right? Like the mobile mapper is only really getting us good road data. So flying it with a drone, no target set down at all, uh, was actually able to 
tie in with all the paint lines as my control in the aerial flight and merge and match the two different data sets together, removing the road out of the UAV data, keeping the road in the mobile mapper, and it came out dead nuts straight on after going back out to the field to check it with uh, GP. I mean, obviously, like I said, GPS, but um, there's a lot of really cool workflows that can help save you time depending on the tool that you're using. Yeah. Yeah, no, and there's, there's, I mean, it's the other thing is this is all evolving so quickly now, and it's really fun to kind of see where we can do that. Of course, indoors GPS doesn't help you much. Um, and that's, 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 uh, that's always the, the fun challenge, but it's, it's great to have control for that. Also, David, you mentioned downstream applications. That's the other thing. It's like, you can get away with manually moving a point cloud against model in a Revit file, if that's the only place that point cloud's ever gonna be. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you've got to go into Navisworks or you've got to go into AutoCAD or you've got to go into something else, now you're replicating a manual move and it's just everything falls apart. You can't get it to match up. The scan's in two different locations in every software and it just gets it gets miserable real fast. It does. It does. And I, I would say a couple things to to note here is one, you know, obviously getting that control point, if you can, if you can have it in the design, so you know where to go, know where there, where your setups are going to be, if you can take the CAD background, stuff like that beforehand, great. If not, make them set as, as we were talking about earlier, you know, set up your control points like these guys here uh, on that picture just painted, you know, they use some paint on the ground to set up this control point, just mark it out and, and leave it there for other people to use. You know what I mean? What? One of the big, I, I've seen a huge issue with this is one person comes out and they set up their control points and they go around, they do scan and they didn't mark anything down. And then someone else comes out and they have a different idea of where these control points should be. Or they have, a, you know, even if you come out the second time and the person has forgotten where those original control points were, once you start moving that, that's when your model just at that point, the point cloud will start overlapping. It gets confused. Uh, it, it, it's just better off if you notate that when you when you when you can right just um, put it on the ground whether it's something temporary or you know you're nailing something into the ground just put something there so others can utilize it moving forward. I wanted to get the panel's thought on um so I had a project come in and uh, so there's lots of scanners but there weren't a lot of bimmers so I was asked to do uh, a K through 12 project and the scans huge huge data so they split them into exterior and interior what happened is is that they split them so beautifully from exterior to interior they didn't actually create any overlap for me to tie them into <laughs> <laughs> and so then i'm trying to like assume that like the wall thickness on the entry point here and i i, I ended up not taking the project because i was like i don't feel confident that i'll be able to create a really good product when you have to split your 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 data you know what are your thoughts on like what how many overlaps like should there be so that whomever is using that scan data downstream doesn't have to do these manual corrections well, I think there's always going to be some manual corrections, especially when you're talking about extremely large projects like that anyway. Um, I mean, like my Pharaoh will do automatic registration all day, but you know, once I start getting a hundred scans at a time that I'm trying to register in one go, like automatic just doesn't work. It's going to start pulling balls in from all over the place. Um, but when it comes to like an indoor versus an outdoor scan, the way I always went about it was I would do two, maybe three scans outside walking my way up to the door. So like if there's a sidewalk, I'd start on the sidewalk and do a couple of jumps down one in the entryway. Um, and then, you know, just if it's a, you know, a school that has a double door, one up front, you know, 10 feet in, there's another door. I would just make sure to jump all the way through that to make sure the overlap is there. And I would do that on a couple exits if possible. So if it's just like a residential building, a front door and a back door, um, if it's a school, like you said, probably extra doors outside of classrooms, um, which I would utilize in it, you know, for that, because I don't think you need a ton, but you want to try and get some kind of exterior, you know, on opposite sides of the building, even if it's so much as like opening a window, if possible, to get shots out that way. Um, and that I've found tends to help quite a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And, you know, I found a, uh, I, I learned a tip and trick actually last week on something like that. Now, this is, of course, a, another form of kind of manual correction. But if you do happen to get files like that, what I learned is that uh, in, in an application such as Recap, when you hover around, you can actually take the coordinates of where your mouse is. And let's say you take uh, coordinates from inside of your building, maybe the interior door corner, something like that. Um, you can take those coordinates and apply them into an Excel spreadsheet. And those are your control points. And essentially, you'll take a few of those from around your building, around your scans, get those control points, those measurements. You bring it in from Excel, from Excel into Recap, and your scan will align based off of those coordinates. Yeah. It's a very cool workflow. Yeah, I know there's... there's, like there's, there's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's, there's I was like, wow, these are so pretty. It's so delineated between X here, but I have no idea how to match these two. <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, that's where that's where having a control system is helpful. You know, if 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 you know that then the scans don't have to overlap, right? You can have great delineation between two data sets as long as somebody carried control and inside those, then you're then you're fine. But if you if you're doing cloud to cloud, yeah, you gotta have overlap. Otherwise it's not gonna work. Um all right. Well, let's. Uh, as much as I would love to uh, uh, keep digging this uh, part of the conversation, I, I do want to hit some of the field challenges that we've talked about. Some of these already. Um, choosing the right scanning settings. Um, you know, we we talked a little bit about that earlier. So I'm just going to jump that uh, based on time and uh, want to talk about in-field no, registry. No, no, no. We got to cover one thing. Okay. When one you thing. scan density. Scan density, so I'm like baseline medium density, right? But I got into a project where I needed to link all of my scans, but it was this tiny little hallway with lots of uh, rooms off of it. And I'm like, this is nuts. So I ended up taking it to low density and getting every tiny room and having it be, and then we had enough overlap so that that low density was reasonable. However, I have found that if I go to low density, um, in a less strategic way that my cloud to cloud registration just fails. So I wanted you guys to speak on, you know, how to strategically use those fast low density scan settings to get through a project. I think it yeah. just really depends on what you're trying to capture. I mean, like in this picture here, like there's pipes everywhere. And if you're trying to accurately model the pipe and the infrastructure, I don't care how big the room is. I'm always doing high density because I'm not trying to play games on, oh crap, my medium or low density just missed the pipe. So now I don't have enough data on those pipes. Um, if we were in the same room, but we don't care about any of the piping or any of that kind of infrastructure and all I need is walls and floors and maybe a staircase, then I could care less and I'll go low all day because all I need is a couple points here and there on the wall to actually make that work. Um, so I think it really just comes down to what you're capturing and why. Yeah, and it's understanding on a lower density that uh, you're gonna need more of those scan locations, I think, for that overlap to get it because you're just you're not getting that many points, right, to get it to recognize. So I think you're you're going to either concentrate on getting through this quick because of course the lower scan uh, scan density will be a faster type of scan. Um, but again, as we were talking about, you know bonding those together with those hybrid uh, elements, those hybrid kind of hardware there, if you can use it with something else, like this is where we can be a little bit quick. We're in a hallway and we just need the walls, the floors, the ceiling, you know, things like that. There might be a couple doors. There's not a lot of detail in here. Great, I'm gonna scan this on low density or use my mobile scanner. But if there's a lot of detail in here, I need to go ahead and get that high level detail, especially if I'm gonna do any type of scan to BIM, if I want, you know, let's say edgewise in this case to run through it and, and recreate my pipes, I need that high level of density in order for that creation. Otherwise, I'm going to be spending all day trying to draw polygons and extract it, and it's just not going to want to work for me. Yeah, well, I, I, I will say that like, the most common thing that I see is people grossly over scan. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think people usually overestimate the density uh, or overestimate their need for density in a lot of situations. Fortunately, on the software side, it's pretty easy to do unification and things like that to cut the density down. You can't add density. So, yeah. you know, I totally agree with yeah. Ryan's point. That's a better mistake to make than understanding. I, so, yeah, you know. I honestly always lean towards using high density more than I do anything else because 
I mean, with the exception of a couple scanners, you know, uh, we're just if we're talking about three different settings, you know, not all the myriad of other things we can do to make a scanner take forever. I always err, always err and lean to in general a higher density scan because there's never been a point in time where I've said to myself, "Crap, I took too much data out of this job site." There's never been a time where I've said that. Um, but there have been times where I've said, crap, I wish I took a little more detail in this model. So I'm not generally a huge fan of using low uh, in any situation because of that, but I also work more towards the scanning side as opposed to you know, a residential kind of scan. But mm -hmm. yeah, I did, uh, I did, oh, sorry, just, I don't wanna take it away again, but I wanted to say, I was thinking about something else here, another kind of field challenge that I dealt with recently um, was a client actually went out to the field and he was working in a crawl space and he wanted to get the structure, um, just kind of the piers and footings of, of uh, how this crawl space was laid out. Well, he didn't know if he needed to go through there and string lights so he could take the scan. And as I'm talking to him, I'm like, well, you know, it's, it's yeah, yeah, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to get there. If you want the, the scan kind of colorized based off of the images, yeah, then you need that color. But if not, your scan can work in the dark. You're going to be looking at intensity or maybe, you know, grayscale or something like that to see what the, the elements that you're looking at from that scan, you might not be able to see the images. So there's going to be kind of little tips and tricks you're going to look at when you're going to set up based off of the project itself and what you're scanning. If you're, um, you know, just trying to get those peers, things like that, like I said, yeah, you don't need lights down there. You can take your scanner, set it up, take your scan and you'll get all of your data um, right there. But again, if you need it colorized, you need more detail. Okay. Yes. You're going to need some light. I, I think this begs, uh, begs for, uh, a scanning after dark podcast now. Yeah, um, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, <laughs> settings. I think that the thing I want a one word answer though, one word answer images for every setup. Yes or no, David. No. Oh, Sorry, ever. jumped the gun. Now I'm David. No. <laughs> We're switching roles again. <laughs> no, I'm going to say no. Ryan? Yeah, no, absolutely not. <laughs> Heck no, right? Yeah. yeah. I, 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 yeah I, I mean, we get that to question be, a lot. I figured I'd just, I'd cut it. They're wonderful, yeah. but they add to the data size, they add to the processing time, and for a lot of deliverables, they add zero value. And so, right. you know, to be just, honest with you, I honestly recommend it strongly in new laser scan users. At that point, if you're just doing this for the first couple times, first couple scans, never not use pictures because learning to read the data set in intensity view or black and white isn't as intuitive as you might think it is. And it definitely takes a little bit of practice to get there. But once you're comfortable looking at the data in that view, unless someone literally pays you a good amount of money more for color, never ever use color and it's not going to help you and it just makes your life more miserable and it's going to take you infinitely longer to collect the data set i mean honestly i think like with the the gls for example if uh i forget the exact times but say the highest density highest accurate scan that can do will take an hour if you add photos it's over two hours to to capture that data so never well, use maybe. images unless you need it it's almost worse for the, the new, the well, higher, right? Because if you're talking about the RTC, right? Like the, it'll scan in 45 seconds at a reasonable resolution, but the images are gonna take, you know, it, it's not another 45 seconds, it's another minute and a half. So it's a three X amplification yeah. factor. It definitely so has, you know, uh, images three to five times, if you don't, the amount of time in the field than if you don't take images. So the qualifications, the qualifications I'll make, um, is one, like I said at the very beginning, you have to know what your scans are going to be used for. Is it just for your internal modeling or are you, uh, you know, basically a subcontractor for, uh, you know, what I've done as an architectural firm? Um, so I will have my uh, photo turned on when I'm in a complex structural environment, like the rafters, and we need to, like, you know, identify, like, what the LVLs are, or, you know, some of those important pieces. Um, I also generally take one 360 view per room so that when I'm modeling, because I have to get the detail of like some of the interior um, features, that grabbing that 360 panel is super helpful when we're 
adding detail to an as-built model, um, but using it strategically. Like, I know once you've taken one 360 from the center of a room, every projection uh, location off of that center, it's unnecessary. Um, and then the other key point is when I'm doing the exterior, uh, if you have a really like complex roof system and you're gonna have to model it, and sometimes those scan, even though you have black and white scan data that you can see, just having a picture that's a con contextual is really helpful. And when you're when you're subcontracted and you're working with for me and working with an architect that doesn't understand what you're doing but loves what you're doing, and I can throw a picture up screenshot and say this is what you're dealing with and sort of like oh they really appreciate that but yeah. then it's really a strategic yeah yeah and I, I mean i well, i think hold on, those... hold on hold on pause 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 we are at time so i do want to do a little quick uh house cleaning uh at the end here and then we can dive into q a right so um uh, a, thank you to everybody who came and joined us uh, and listened to the last hour. Uh, we will go through the kind of questions and, and maybe bring up a couple more topics in the next 20, 20, 30 minutes. So if you've got the time, if you're still eating your lunch, hang out with us. Uh, we'll keep chatting. Um, if you don't and you need to run, uh, we are, we're still recording. So you can always uh, pick it up later with recording. Uh, but I want to say thank you so much to our wonderful, wonderful panelists, uh, including our uh, personality switchers, Lindsay and David, and of course, <laughs> uh, for, for all the awesome insights and, uh, and comments. Uh, so thank you guys. If somebody's got to run, thank you all attendees. Uh, as, as usual, a wonderful Scandinavian University. Can we so. away how fast an hour goes on these things? Yeah, they they have these really things bad. called clocks, um, and you can <laughs> you can put them on your your wrist, and it's this, this incredible watch thing, and 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 so we moderators have to keep track of this stuff. <laughs> yep. Uh, talking about scan to bam is just like doing scan to bam. It's that you get immersed in like the level of detail that you're able to capture, <laughs> and you just go down a rabbit hole and like. You know, time be damned, you know, just yep. this is amazing stuff. Yep. Tangents everywhere. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, well I I wanted to put this up and, and get panelists' opinions on this. So this was um uh this is a project uh, that was scanned in Australia in a convention center. Um and uh this is one of the other things that I think surprises people when they first get into scanning and right now? <laughs> they do a building. And then they um, they realize that <laughs> lasers bounce off mirrors and refract through glass and then pick up extraneous information. And then you end up with, with this thing, um, which this is just what the raw data looks like when you when you get your 137 scan locations back. And you know, probably 50, you know, probably 40 to 50 percent of the data on this project had to get deleted because it was all through glass or bounced off mirrors or bounced off glass or reflective ceiling tiles or stuff like that so um one of the one of the questions that we had uh, come in was on dealing with reflected ref, you know reflective or um refracting you know clear transparent materials so any anybody have some good tips or advice on dealing with these things in the field obviously yeah. there's lots of stuff in back office processing but that's next month's class so any kind of in the field tips that, that you guys have collected over the years? Yeah, so this happened to me before. Um, one of my first scans, so I know the pain all, all too well. And it took, a, it was, it took me more time to clean the scans than it probably would have taken me to actually survey the damn thing. But um, what I do on projects like this, where you got like an entire wall that's just window, if you don't need the the act, you don't. If you don't need that exterior wall to be super super accurate, I just take a tarp and hang it up across the entire thing. Like I'll get a big canvas tarp and just stick it up there, however I can, and roll with it, so I don't deal with those reflections. Um, but you know, there's other ways. I mean, if you just get like a roll of paper or something, the width of the window, tape it in the window. Anything that you can do to block that out. Also, if you're gonna 
do like paper, I'd recommend going like a color, not necessarily white because you can probably still see through it and not necessarily black because black presents like a dark black presents a whole nother layer of problems. But um, like if you absolutely needed it and you didn't have paper or tarp, the way I would like, there's really not a good way to go about this without covering them in some sense. Like if you need the accuracy of the, you know, the metal holding those windows together, and you don't have paper to in like get it in between. I would do one pass using cardboard, canvas, anything to block the windows on the interior scans, the initial interior scans. And then I'd honestly probably come back, take the cardboard off and do another separate set of scans of the window fixture itself and focusing on that. That way I have one set of rooms that are ideal. And then I have another set where it's a lot easier to clean this mess up if I know I only need the window frames because now I can do an area delete and just only keep the general area of the frames. And then I can go in and delete the reflections a lot quicker and a lot easier than trying to delete all of this nonsense noise inside of the building. Yeah. Yeah, no, and it's, it's, it's craft it's, paper. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Sticky back paper. Not white, not black. I've I've also really enjoyed uh, the uh, the baby powder mixed in alcohol. Uh, that works surprisingly well if people don't mind cleaning the baby powder later. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know it doesn't have to be like completely tarped over. It just needs to have enough that they'll you'll get a bounce off the glass. So like don't clean the windows if they're dirty. Um, I have dogs at my house, so when I scan with the scanner, the bottom half of the windows show up from all the nose prints, and then the top half of the windows are clear, and I get data out of them. So, um, you know, dogs is another pro tip. Just take really big dogs to all your projects and have them nose over the windows, and you'll you'll get them in your scan data. Yeah, just lick uh, the windows first, right? Just lick. <laughs> but don't lick the scanner. Uh, right? Unless uh, you are wearing thick gloves, then you can't touch the button. Yeah, oh, there you go. There you go. See, we did get that tip in. There you go. Uh, I also absolutely. like using the painters, um, the stuff you put on the floor for painting to keep anything off and painters tape. That stuff works really well. It's pretty thick. It's brown. You, it usually works pretty well. That's like canvas tarps. Mm -hmm. And if we, we've got some questions in here about transient noise. Well, that's what I call it. Um, moving objects in your scan. Um, and, and we actually had this picture from one of our uh, prior webinars. I love this. Um, semi trucks moving through the, your scenes as you scan. That, that looks like a lot of great walls uh, for this cloud to cloud algorithm to try and fit together. Um, in fact, there may be more truck than there are actual walls, uh, at which case you start to have real problems with your cloud to cloud registrations, right? Uh, yeah. Well, going back to the last one, so is that you're, are you able to do cloud to cloud with that in that all glass building? And does that make it better or is that? Oh, it doesn't make it better. It makes it worse. worse. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so like this is, and we'll talk about this in the next webinar, uh, which uh, is coming up, but basically, um, you know, this is why before you do cloud to cloud, if you have this stuff, you have to clean the data first clean the data, then do cloud to cloud. Otherwise you'll get massive errors uh, as a result of all these little things. But- well, that was like uh, a new and fancy thing I discovered when I was in Register 360 versus Recap is being able to cloud, clean the clouds, the individual cloud points. I know. Yeah, that's a huge thing. And, and some, some of Super your processing important. softwares will also um, recognize it, I've seen. They'll also recognize when there's movement and they'll, it'll help to automate cleaning up the, the point cloud to take those out. Whereas in like recap, if I see that, I try to delete it. It just deletes all my point. <laughs> it right. deletes all the points. They're gone. To be honest with you, like if you're like cleaning this up manually prior can be fairly time consuming. Uh, depending on the project size and the amount of scans, I tend to just be like, and it depends on too what you're looking to get, right? Like if I'm just looking for the asphalt here and not necessarily like pylon structures, because that presents a whole nother problem while you're trying to clean this up. But um, I don't. I would honestly export out these scans with this heavy noise separately as their own LES LAZ file, and then run it through one of the various programs that does very good 
ground extraction. Um, yeah. Like pretty much everyone has it. So I would just run it there, get rid of the trees, get rid of the cars. Now I have a good LAS, LAZ, and then bring it into recap to, to stitch it. However, whether it's cloud to cloud or targets. Yeah, and it's, it's one of the interesting things is that I feel like that is really far along on infrastructure but that functionality does not work at all uh inside vertical construction uh projects it's just uh it's, it, you're down yeah. to manual cleaning with those and so right there's a couple other good pro tips um usually that data is a much lower intensity so you can do some selection with intensity filters and get rid of a lot of data that's through glass uh but you risk losing data on things like ductwork or other surfaces that don't scan well um, so there's there's some stuff like that that you can do uh, range somebody actually mentioned using range filter um, if you if, if you've got a lot of data coming through glass and your scans are close to it at least with those scans you can kind of cut the range down and then just automatically clean up data that way um, but yeah it, the, on the processing side there's a lot of stuff to do um, potentially um, but and we, we've got a question here about uh, infield registration as well. And so this was one of the topics we'd wanted to talk about today. But I think, you know, we've all heard horror stories, right, of people doing the scanning, coming back in the office, and the registration doesn't work. And so, like, to me, you know, I always warn people, infield registration is never the final registration. Uh, and that's because they don't let you do a lot of things that you want to do to kind of tighten up your errors and do all this other stuff to kind of make sure you're getting a good deliverable. Plus, you can't really check it very thoroughly in the field. But it's a phenomenal way to make sure you've got enough setups and enough overlap and you've got the right data for you to get a good registration once you get back in the office and to have a big head start on that stuff. I don't know if anybody wants to elaborate on that. I mean, yeah, with that- Yeah, for a big exciting moment. But you can go first, right? It's okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, when it comes to like struggling to register back at the office, um, this is gonna sound a little weird, but the way I've always gone about it is making sure I have a couple different ways, to, a diff couple different programs that I can register it in. And generally, you know, I've always used two. It's either the default one that comes from the manufacturer. So like Pharaoh Scene, Leica's, Re what is it? Reality Capture app or, so I forget. Register. Actually, like, register, yeah. Many, that's um, many names. Cyclone Register yeah. 360. Cyclone, right. So um, I start with that. If that's giving me problems, I'll bring it into recap. And I've honestly never had a project I couldn't get to register into recap. Um, as long as there was some kind of overflow, uh, some kind of uh, overlap, I've never had a, personally, I've never had a problem in recap getting them to register. But I'm also not talking cloud to cloud. I personally, I am not a fan of cloud to cloud in any situation in which I'm using a laser scanner, because if I have a scanner, that means I already want it to be accurate. So cloud to cloud for me personally is out every single time I'm always going to use some kind of target. But when I use recap in a situation like that, I am using targets, whether it's a target I can I put out there um, in the field. But if I didn't, then I'm picking corners of a building or you know anything that I can somewhat reliably select multiple times. So so I'm I'm this this brings up an interesting topic. And and so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this out there um, just as a challenge. Um, when we went back and audited our projects um, uh, at, at my prior employer, um, you know, we did somewhere between 50 and 100 scan jobs a year. We discovered that cloud to cloud was consistently more accurate than target or survey base. Consistently more accurate. Um, and, and because you don't have to level a pole perfectly, you don't have millimeters of air coming from not perfectly leveled poles on targets. You don't have millimeters of air. Now, that would be local accuracy within about 100, uh, oops, about 100 meters, right? So within a space, we got much better registrations out of cloud to cloud. Over the entire building, we would get worse error from cloud to cloud, which is precisely why I'm a huge fan of hybrid registration. Because within a very small area, you, if you use targets or survey control, I guarantee you, if you zoom in on the wall and color by scan, you will see multiple lines for that wall. If you do cloud to cloud, you can get those things down to a single line. 
but that error will compound over you know 300 or 400 scans so if you don't have that overall survey control your overall building dimensions will be off by you know centimeters right so like this is this is I, you know, I'm, I'm just curious because i'm hearing this yeah. targets because my experience has been that targets are oh, okay. so i didn't know that there was I didn't know we we called it hybrid because I just do that regardless. So of course you're gonna have you're gonna have you know planes that are very easily matched or elements on those uh, walls or ceiling features that you can use as a target. And then the cloud to cloud in the field, my key workflow is that so when I'm in Register 360 in their field application, we create bundles, which is like you know bundles in the basement. So these are all the scans in the basement bundled together main floor bundled together. I've got this 10,000 square foot house, so I've got wings. And I would say the key to my workflow with the bundles is creating a cloud to cloud bundle in areas, but not necessarily connecting all of those bundles in the field application. That you wait to connect those bundles when you're in the desktop version, um, because then that way what what i discovered happened was that they started met it started matching bundles that had nothing to do with each other yeah. Um, yeah so that was sort of like that key point is that if you're going to do cloud to cloud know its limitations and keep it to a very accurate area the other key point i would say is that if you're in a space that has identifiable planar uh, surfaces like true walls then the cloud to cloud works really well where i needed to bring in targets is when i had to do a framing scan so went to a commercial space they had their framing the framing walls up but they had no drywall up yeah. so if you're relying on that cloud to cloud to identify a two by four it's different from here or there you fail 100 times you're going to fail so that's yeah. where you absolutely put those targets at different heights Make sure you have more targets than you than you think you need, and don't assume that you're going to be able to register through a framed wall because you won't. It's not like you get to do less just because there's no drywall. You still need to do those connection points. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, try, try if you need to move through it fast, like do a hallway, but maybe do like five low density scans down that hallway, and then do your medium and high density into the into the spaces. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, Oh, go ahead. Try try troubleshooting a cloud to cloud registration. Good luck. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah. That's the other reason why I love having targets. It, like the you know when I say hybrid, I'm, every registration I'm using a combination of cloud to cloud targets and survey control. When when I'm doing scanning, that is the best. Yeah. Yeah, because then you all you have multiple. They all make up for each other. Cloud to cloud strong at some things. Targets are strong at some things, and survey control is strong at some things. You're getting the benefits of all three. They're making up for the weaknesses of all three. And you can troubleshoot targets. Like we had jobs where the target's only purpose on those jobs was basically to check the quality of the registration. We recognized the targets, checked them, but they were weighted super low in the constraints because the cloud to cloud gave us better, accurate, more accurate results, but we could figure out the one or two scans that were bad because the target errors are easy to understand. They're X, Y, Z, whereas cloud to cloud errors are RMS actually try and explain that to someone i mean i've had we have phd mathematicians that work at clear edge that write our software they can explain it and understand it yeah. <laughs> and i do i do want to second Lindsay's point there in terms of um like making those those point cloud like groups or um those kind of well i just want to call them groups but uh um if you can kind of group those scans together and know which ones you've scanned in that kind of group or that bundle it's really going to help you with processing that point cloud and bringing it in like if you need to do some cleanup but also organizing it because like like i said here i i did i scanned a well i i was assisting with the the scan processing with this three-story building and i found out you know as we're going through we just brought all the scans in we tried you know bringing all all, all of it together and the first second and third floor are stacking right on top of each other they don't recognize even though we had you know the stairs and things like that in the scans um a lot of times it's good to go ahead and get those bundles in get that first level or what have you done cleaned up and then bring in your next level go ahead and start you know organizing that and then keep going from there at least that's what i've found through um through some of these classes i've been teaching 
My other hack is when you're trying to use uh, some sort of feature like on, on the wall or on the ceiling, I have, I have blue painter's tape so that I know if I'm gonna use that switch box as, as a target, then I'll slap a piece of blue tape on that one so that I can get all the different levels and then it's easy for me to grab that. I mean, that's what my workflow was in uh, recap before we got into Register 360 is because um, the, recap, the recap mobile, which has now been retired, um, you, could only, you could only register if you did a sequence of registering, like otherwise they were disconnected and you stopped being able to register in the field. So using that blue tape on some unique wall features features or ceiling features so that you know you can just grab those quick as your three connecting points was a really it's it's it was very easier than taking a huge piece of paper with a target on it yeah i i definitely agree and another kind of um tip i know we saw them there on the targets there uh, a few slides ago but numbers if you have any uh targets you know just write a number on there if you have to slap those targets around in, in numerical sequence and you know where you are inside of that building when you're processing it. That's a lot of help to know which target this is and, and help align yourself when you're processing it. Yeah, though, though I'll tell you like all the, we, we did our own version of this and like we had the black and white like pushed all the way up to the edge and sometimes the edge of the target would get cropped off depending on the printer, but we did that so the number would be the full width of the page as big as possible, right? Because the target without the number isn't very useful and if you scan that thing from any reasonable distance you can't read the number so then the number is useless so like we made the number like ridiculously large relative to the target so that you know you could just get oh that's target you know one that's target 143 or that's target you know 27 or whatever um we, I, we got a good question about edge effect so um another type of noise that you get from scanners it's it's called a split pixel noise uh or edge effect or you know there's a lot of different names for it but basically it comes as a result of you know the laser uh from your scanner you know basically being split so like imagine you know right now the laser is on my finger but it's also on the keyboard right so it's like shining on both things at the same time uh, depending on the hardware and the software um the pixel will or the the measurement will either be here down on the keyboard or right in between the two <laughs> And it's the right in between the two is the most common issue because basically what's happening is it sees both returns and it averages them. So if, you know, half of it's on the keyboard, half's on my finger, it's right in the middle. If three quarters is on my finger and a quarter's on the keyboard, it's closer to my finger. And then you get all these lines trailing off of it. Um, and so, you know, that's one of those things that that's that data you pretty much have to live with. Uh, it's really hard to clean out and it's not worth the effort, but uh, higher end scanners do a much better job with uh, with mixed pixel filtering, both in the firmware and the higher end processing uh, softwares usually have filters for that as well. So, you know, the, if, if you bring a raw scan into recap, you're not going to get any reasonable uh, edge filtering uh, on those things. If you bring a raw scan into something like Cyclone or uh, laser control or uh, you know, ferrocene, they have reasonably good uh, edge effect or mixed pixel filtering in the processing software. And then likewise, if you have like a, you know, ZNF or an RTC or a P20 or a GLS, uh, one of the higher end scanners, those things are, do a really good job of mixed pixel filtering internally. So the data that comes off of them is just cleaner. Um, but that's, think, that's really a scanner and a processing uh, kind of challenge. You're saying like, what we were talking about earlier, you know, using multiple tools for a project and how that's kind of fun when you have the option to, like, depending on what you're doing, obviously, if you're doing ducks where you have tons of them, it makes it very difficult. But we're talking, like, say, walls where you have to model those walls and you really just don't want that edge effect. I mean, that's kind of where you can start to bring photogrammetry into to kind of solve that problem because it's, you know, depending on the camera, depending on how you're capturing it, you can get extremely tight, good data using photogrammetry. Um, and it's kind of where you can start to merge that kind of data set in with, with the LIDAR stuff or with the, you know, the terrestrial scanners. Yeah, that's, that's one of those interesting things. I think, you know, in general for building construction, photogrammetry is a very difficult tool to use because the algorithms are designed to look for patterns in the image data to match the images. 
And so you end up, you know, basically having really bad problems when you have a bunch of walls all painted the same color or brick or tile, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it tends in the past, it's kind of been bookended. Photogrammetry is really great for kind of aerial photography to get overall building, get rooftops, because fortunately when it rains and you have water stains on the roof, that is a naturally non-reoccurring pattern. Um, so you get roofs really well, you can get parking lots, you know, the kind of uh, area outside the building. It's also been really good at historic preservation. And people think, oh, well, photogrammetry, its accuracy is low. Well, no, its accuracy is related to the size of the pixel. And so if you have a really high-end DSLR and you're, you know, 18 inches from a statue, you can get sub-millimeter accuracy out of a out of photogrammetry. You can get incredible accuracy, but you also take like a thousand pictures of one statue, you know. Right. And I think like depending on like indoors, it's actually getting a lot better now with like the iPhones being able to capture photos as well as some higher end cameras that actually uh, have like, you know, the IMU information that can apply to the EXIF images. Um, but like, I mean, even using an iPhone camera right now, you can get extremely nice looking data that solves that problem. And because it had like, because of the software, a lot of photogrammetry software ours included has ways to account for those kind of similar geometric, uh, you know, shapes in, in a typical building. We actually can use those to help better, uh, you know, process the data. So it comes out even cleaner. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, so it's getting better all the time. And video, video, using video to do photogrammetry exactly. is another great way to improve that because you get much better overlap frame to frame. So yeah. really, really fun, exciting stuff happening with photogrammetry indoors, uh, certainly. Uh, looking forward to that uh, over the next year or two, see how, how yeah. far it goes. But we are at our 30 minute after cutoff. I am going to end it here. Uh, we do have a couple little questions left uh, that we didn't quite get to. So I'll follow up afterwards with people uh, as, as soon as we can. And uh, just two quick plugs. Uh, obviously, next Scandinavian University will be a month from now. Uh, that webinar is going to be focused on processing and registration. Uh, so we'll have uh, some great panelists for that and really be talking about the next step in the process. And then the second thing is for those really interested in control, uh, Clear Edge 3D is actually going to be doing a webinar uh, probably in about two or three weeks uh, on uh, setting control for laser scanning. So it's gonna be focused on using either uh, you know, a total station style instrument or a hybrid style instrument like that GTL we popped up earlier to establish control for uh, scanning projects. So if that's something you really wanna dig into the weeds on uh, and kind of see some of the equipment and how it works, uh, please, please, please uh, check that out. It'll of course be on our social media feeds and everything else so um but yeah thank thank you guys panelists for sticking around for the extra 30 minutes of q a and chatting uh and thank you to all of our wonderful attendees and we will see you on the next one so adios thank you thank Thanks. you <laughs> and it always takes me way longer than i think to end the webinar that always feels <laughs> awkward Come on, where's the button? Come on, pop up on my screen already. All right, there it is. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>